Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Grace Anglican Church meeting here in Carlsbad this morning. And uh, if if we have any visitors here today, and because I'm I'm a guest, I don't know if we do or not, but you all look pretty familiar to me, I have to say. So if we have visitors here today, welcome especially to you and to this uh, service of Holy Communion. One of the great... um, privileges of being Anglicans is that we have more than our local church. Now, our local church is the center of of our worship life and our life in Christ, but but there are bigger circles beyond it. And and, uh, pardon me while I do just quick Anglican ecclesiology here. So local church and, and the next unit of the churches that are Anglican around us that we relate to is called what? The deanery. The deanery. And why is that important this week? Because we have a deanery meeting here on Saturday, starting with worship at 10 a.m., to which you are all invited. And not just invited, we know where you live. <laughs> so please come. It's a worship for all of our Anglican churches here in the San Diego area. And then some fun afterwards, but I'll save the announcement for announcement time on that when somebody else will, will talk about that. But I want you to know that's the deanery. And this is a chance for you to get to know other Anglicans here in the San Diego area and to worship and fellowship with them. Now, there's another unit beyond that, the deanery, which is called what? The diocese. diocese. And that's always like this big cloud out there, the diocese. The diocese is people. You're you're part of the diocese. It's you. It's all of us gathered together under the leadership of Bishop Keith. And so one of the things I'm encouraging our congregations to do this summer is to especially pray for our bishop. Um, Keith, because uh, Keith Andrews, because he's on sabbatical this summer, and he he put off the sabbatical for two years, so he really needed it. So let's pray for refreshment and the filling of the Holy Spirit for him, so that when he comes back, he can lead us into mission and ministry as a whole diocese, and what's smaller than the diocese, as a deanery with Dean Bill, who is the rector here, forgot to put that little important point in, and then as, as the local congregation under your rector, um, Dean Bill will be back next week, I, uh, I understand. So would you please stand as we begin our worship with our opening song? <laughs>
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be the kingdom now and forever. Amen. And we say together, please, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of our humble servants, and that we may receive what we ask. Teach us by your Holy Spirit to ask only those things that are pleasing to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the same Spirit lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. Good morning. The first reading this morning will be done as soon as I put my glasses on. Oh. It is Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. 
This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the, with the sword. Then Am, um, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel, the word of the Lord. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 85, and we'll do this as usual alternately by whole verse. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity. You have your faults. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. The glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. I have to take my glasses off to read. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our transgressions, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, 
making known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Please be seated. 
20 years ago, uh, next month, I began working on my Doctor of Ministry degree at what was then Trinity Episcopal School for Ministry outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's now just Trinity School for Ministry. I graduated from college in 1971. So if you can do the arithmetic, I just had my fifth, 50th college reunion. Um, and I graduated from seminary in 1975, and I thought I'm done with school for a long time. But when I got in my early 50s, I found that I needed some new study and renewal in my life. And so I, I packed off for a few weeks in August of 2001 to Trinity School for Ministry. Now, the first class I had there that August was an introductory class. That was good. It, it, it was very good, as a matter of fact, and I made some good friendships in that class. But it was the second class I had that August that really changed my ministry and my preaching. Are you ready for the title of the class? I know your, your heart is going to beat fast. It was called Evangelical Theology for a Pluralistic Age. Ooh. Does not sound real exciting, does it? But it, it, it was taught by a wise, older, retired bishop, Bishop Fitzsimmons Allison, who had been the bishop of, of Diocese of South Carolina. And it was the insights from that class that really changed me. And, and here, was the, here was the primary insight that, that I took away from that class that the Christian message, what we call the gospel, begins with God and what God has done for us in Christ. It does not begin with us. Wow, what a concept. That, that, that it's not our reaching out and finding God. We often use that language, you know, somebody found God. But that's not really it. It's God reaching out and finding us. What, what God has done be, before we can ever do anything. And, and what's true of the gospel, the Christian message, is also true of how we live out the gospel, what we call the Christian life. It begins with God, what God has already done for us. It doesn't begin with our effort to try to obey or do something with God. The Christian life that we lead is a gift that God has already given to us. And we respond to that gift in thankful living. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul does in his letter to the Ephesians. If you were listening, you heard that long lesson from Ephesians chapter 1. And in verse 3, I put up on the screen because I want you to look at it before your eyes glaze over. That after Paul does his, his greeting, you know, to, from, um, and, and his, his usual beginning in his letter, he, said, he writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, who's already done something, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, before we were ever born or thought of, before there was a world or a universe, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Do you see this? Paul is saying the Christian message, the Christian life, begins with what God has already done for us. It doesn't begin with us. And then Paul goes on in the next 10 verses following in Ephesians 1 to describe in some, I would, I would almost say, excruciating detail to describe some of the things that God has done for us, some of those spiritual blessings, some of the things he's already given to us in Christ. It's a complicated description because... In the Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, it's one long sentence. 
It's a run-on sentence for those of you who are English teachers. I bet you have some here. It just goes on and on and on. I'd like to, to break up that long run-on sentence in, in, into four bits for you. Four of the different gifts that God has given us. Four things that God has already done for us. Because this is where the gospel begins, right? With what God has done for us. Here are the four things. God has adopted us, redeemed us, revealed something to us, and guaranteed something to us. So there's kind of the, the outline of where I'm going today for those of you who like to be organized and know what's going on. So what has God done for us? First, he has adopted us as his children at the end of verse four into verse five in love God predestined us for adoption, there's that word, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. If you grew up as I did, listening to Billy Graham, you recognized the term born again. That was indeed the title of his autobiography, which he wrote a number of years ago. And, and, and he popularized that term to talk about us as Christians, born again. And of course, he didn't invent it because it comes from John chapter 3, where our Lord Jesus Christ says to Nicodemus, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus here uses a metaphor, the metaphor of physical birth, to illustrate how we join his kingdom. It takes a spiritual birth. We become part of Jesus' family, of God's family, by a spiritual birth. We're born again. And, and that birth is not of our own efforts, but it's God's gracious work in us. But, but the Apostle Paul uses a different metaphor it's related. He doesn't use the metaphor of birth. He uses the metaphor of adoption to make the same point here. In another one of Paul's epistles, Galatians chapter 4, he writes, God sent forth his son so that we might receive adoption as sons of God. So when Jesus talks about being born into the family, Paul talks about being adopted into the family. And what he's doing here is he's using a Roman custom where a childless couple would adopt one of their household servants and make that servant a full son so that when, when they died, that adopted servant who had become a son would now inherit all of their property, that, that he'd no longer be a servant He'd be a son, and because he was a son, he'd be an heir and would, would have all the benefits of being a son, not just some of the benefits of being a, a servant. Uh, earlier this month, I had the wonderful privilege of being in an adoption ceremony for two people I know well. I had been the celebrant at their wedding 10 years ago. And after they were married, a couple of more years of schooling, and then they wanted to start a family. And, and she got pregnant. And at the eighth month, she, uh, she had a miscarriage. And they tried again. And there was a second miscarriage. And they tried again. And there was a third miscarriage. And they were brokenhearted. Who wouldn't be? And then somebody said, have you tried foster care leading to adoption? Do you hear that word? And they did. And so they, they got a little girl, I think she was about eight or nine months old, and, and they took her in foster care with, with the possibility of adoption, and they had for her for about 15 months. And, and all the things that go into adopting a child like that. And... And when I was there on the 2nd of July, we were family, friends, there were 15 of us in a room with the parents and the little girl. And, and the adoption still had to be done by Zoom. Um, the judge had decided. And, and the judge signed the final decree. 
And she became their daughter by adoption. Do you think there was joy in that room, in that household? Gosh, every day there's a post on Facebook of a new picture of her. <laughs> and, and that's what God has done for us. He, he has taken us and adopted us into his family. And do you think there's joy in heaven on that adoption? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And what's the first blessing? He's adopted us as his children. You are an adopted child of God. You're not a servant. I, I know the colic this morning says we are humble servants. But, but you're no longer a servant of God. You're a child you have all the rights and privileges of God's family. And that's the beginning of the gospel message, isn't it? Not what you do, but what God has done for you. And the second thing he's done for us is God has redeemed us from our sins. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of grace, which he has lavished on him. Man, I love that word lavish. Not just, eh, I'm going to pour a little on you, but just lavished on it, pouring out his grace on us in gallons and gallons of grace. Now, if you grew up in the 1940s and 50s, you might remember S and H green, S and H green stamps. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I see some heads nodding. They were little greens. They were green, and they said S and H on them. And when you went to the, you was usually the grocery store. However much you spent, they give you a certain number of S and H green stamps, and then you'd bring them home, and you you'd lick them. I always got to lick my parents' S and H green stamps. You'd lick them, and there was a little book you put them in. Remember that? And when you got enough in the book or books, because it usually took a bunch of books. What would you do with those s &H green stamps? You would take them to where? Redemption. The Redemption Center. And you'd plunk down your books of s &H green stamps, and then you could get something that was appropriate for the amount of stamps you had. I got my first baseball mitt <laughs> through s &H green stamps at a Redemption Center. For those of you who remember baseball in the good old days, it was a Al Kaline special. Whoa, that's, that's going back a long way. He is in the Hall of Fame, by the way. Wonderful baseball player. That's what, that, that gives you an idea of redemption, isn't it? You, 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 you pay a price and, and you get something for that. For the Ephesians, the term redemption would have reminded them of the price you paid to get a prisoner out of prison. You'd have to pay a redemption price or to set a slave free. If there was a slave and you wanted to give that slave freedom, you would pay a redemption price. Not quite s &H green stamps, probably pretty expensive. But that's what the word that we translate redemption means. It means paying a price to set somebody free. Now, one of the things the Bible tells us is that all human beings are slaves to sin and death. That is part of our, our, our nature. We're born as slaves of sin. We cannot free ourselves any more than a slave could free himself or herself in ancient times. But but something really important happened 2,000 years ago. God the Father sent his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our redemption, to pay the price to set us free from sin and death, a price we cannot, could not, could never pay by ourselves. God paid for us. The redemption for the forgiveness of sins. We can't pay that price because Jesus has already paid it. He has already paid the price for our 
our freedom. The only thing we can do is accept that freedom. A number of months ago, I had a conversation with an elderly gentleman. I'll, I'll call him Joe. That's not his name. And, and, and Joe's had an interesting life. And, and uh, Joe probably had one too many drinks that, that evening, too. But, but he, was, he was just lamenting some of the things he'd done in his life. He said, I've done some bad things. I just, I just, I just would, would like to somehow make them straight. You know, I'd, I'd like to, to do some, something to just make it better for the bad things I did. I want to make it right. And I said to him, you can never do enough to make it right. You can't pay the price of your own redemption. There is only one person who can do that. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ because he's already paid it for you. But you can receive that. So... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's adopted us into his family. He's redeemed us from our sins. Third, he's, re he's revealed to us the mystery of the universe. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Some of you may remember a famous movie from the late 1960s. The movie was entitled Alfie. If you remember it, you may not own up to the fact that you saw it. It's not a very nice movie. I don't recommend it. But the movie was known most for the theme song that was sung. I am not going to try to sing the theme song. But it starts out, what's it all about, Alfie? Pretty good, huh? And it goes on. Is it just for the moment we live? What's it all about when you sort it out, Alfie? In the movie, there's this young man, his name is Alfie, and he, he's not a very nice character. He, he mistreats all those around him, particularly women. He's deceptive, he's conniving, he's manipulative, and his life falls apart. And, and the theme song expresses it. What's it all about, Alfie? What are we here for? What are, what are we living? Isn't that the most basic question of life? I mean, isn't, isn't that deep down inside what everybody is asking? Is the universe we live in random, or does it have a purpose? Are we headed somewhere as individuals in a human race, or is it nowhere we're going? Do you and I matter as an individual, or are we just a bunch of matter in a random universe? God has already answered that question for us in and through Christ. What's it all about, Alfie? Our destiny, our future as human beings, is to be like Jesus Christ. In a universe where everything is brought into harmony, where there is no longer disruption, where there is no longer sin or death or decay. And all of that is in and through Jesus Christ. That's our destiny. That's what it's all about. That's the purpose. And that's what God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ. He has shown us in Jesus, in his resurrected body, what we will be in a universe made new and whole in him. Eugene Peterson, in his New Testament paraphrase, the message puts it this way. God set it all out before us in Christ. A long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's adopted us into his family. He's redeemed us from our sins. He's revealed to us the mystery, the purpose of the universe. And finally, he's guaranteed our promised future. The future that has been revealed to us, he's guaranteed to us. Verse 13, in him that is in Christ, you also, 
when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire our possession of it. At some point, most of us here in this room have paid a down payment on something we bought over time. You know what a down payment is. You see something, you can't quite afford it, so you say, here's a certain amount of money, and, and I'll put it down. It's my promise I'll pay you the whole thing. That's, that's what a down payment is. It says, in a way, I am serious, and I intend to make a full payment on this. So God who adopted us, who redeemed us, who revealed the future to us, has given us a down payment on that future. And that down payment is the Holy Spirit. The very presence of God in our lives, the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living in us. Now, when I was a child going to Sunday school, one of the things that I learned is that when I believed in Jesus, he came to live in my heart. And I, and I, I, I can see the little church building. I went to a Methodist church about eight or nine years old. And the, and the teacher, and she had kind of a, 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 a big poster on a board. And there was kind of an outline of a human being. And right way in the center of, of the chest, there were, there were two doors. Some of you may have seen this. And when you opened the doors, there was a picture of Jesus in, in the heart. And it, I remember it. It worked. That, that Jesus isn't somebody out there, but, but he comes to live inside us. When I got in seminary, I got a little bit more sophisticated. And I actually learned that that's the presence of Jesus by his Holy Spirit. But you get the picture. God has given us himself to live in us. We're, we're not on our own. We're not, it's not like we believe in Jesus and now try harder, see if you can do it. God has given us himself to live in us, to begin working on us and with us and sometimes against us what we need to be worked against so that we might become like Jesus, so we might fulfill our destiny and be like our risen Lord. The Holy Spirit is the down payment on the glorious future that God has promised. There is a line in our baptismal liturgy. After the baptism, when the priest takes the chrism, the oil, and marks the sign of the cross on the newly baptized, and what does the priest say? You are sealed with the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. You've got the guarantee of the Holy Spirit in you now. And Christ has marked you forever. <laughs> blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What has God done for us? He has adopted us, redeemed us, revealed the future, the mystery of the purpose of the universe to us, and guaranteed that future to us by the gift of his Holy Spirit. That's how the gospel begins. That's the beginning of the message. Not with us, but with what God has done and what God continues to do by his grace in our life. So is there anything we do? Well, let me give you two quick things, real quick. We're, we're getting to the end. How do we respond to all of this that God has done for us? We stay attached to Jesus Christ. And we stay attached to his church. What do I mean by that? Stay attached to Jesus Christ. Do you notice in that one long run-on sentence from, from Ephesians 1, 3 uh, to verse 14 where it ends, do you notice how often Christ is mentioned? In him through him, in Jesus Christ, in the beloved, in him, through Jesus Christ. I think almost every verse, sometimes two times a verse, it mentions Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul makes this point over and over. All that God has done for us, he has done in and through Jesus Christ. So stay attached to him. 
Worship him. Pray to him. Learn about him. Feed on his word. Because that's how these blessings become realized in our lives, how they flow to us in Christ and outside of Christ. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. No one receives these blessings except through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then stay attached to the church. One of the great biblical scholars of our time says that in Christ, in these verses, is also a reference to Christ's body, the church. The Apostle Paul makes this point at the end of the chapter. We didn't read all the way to the end. But the end of the chapter, he says that, the, that, that Jesus Christ is the head of the church, his body. And so star, part of staying attached to Jesus is staying attached to his people. This is not a solitary life. We as believers need one another. This is his body. And so we need to stay attached to the church. This is the place, and these are the people with which, in a very special way, you meet the Lord Jesus Christ every week. You are right now meeting him and staying attached to him by being here in this worship, by hearing his word proclaimed, by sharing with one another, by coming to this table and feeding on his body and blood. And that's how the blessings flow into our lives, the things that God has already done for us. So I began this sermon by talking about what I learned 20 years ago in a class at Trinity School for Ministry. What did I learn? The Christian message begins with God, what he has done for us, not with us and what we do. What has God done for us? Adopted us, redeemed us, revealed the future to us, the mystery of the future, and guaranteed that we will participate in it. And how do we respond? Stay attached to him and his church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Please stand. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, say, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, of all, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for church and the world saying hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, Keith Andrews, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now you are invited to add your own petitions and thanksgivings. Prayers of thanksgiving for continued healing with Pastor Carol. Prayers for myself now. Father, we thank you for the last two weeks, and we we are grateful for our brother Canon David for the way he served us. I will pray for, for blessings on his life. Prayers for the restoration of marriage and family. Prayers for my sister Sarah, and she continues to fight, and she says thank you for the prayers, and she is in Russia was yesterday. So, that's some days ago, thank you for your prayers. First, for my cousin Kate, uh, she suffers from COVID. It's not to be restored. Not back to the uh, this man. Great, my friend David. Lord, please continue to help him. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are so sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways for the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, 
have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Hear these comfortable words. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Please exchange the peace with those around you. So just some quick announcements. So we already talked about this. I think we can skip this, just note the date. So this is a Tuesday meetings. I think they will begin at this week, hopefully. I yes. think. So if you if you wanna if you enjoy thinking, you should try this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the morning time. So I'm thinking uh, Yeah, if you have any plastic or any bottle or anything, please bring it to church so we can use that money for you know, God's work. Uh, thank you for all your thoughts and giving. Uh, everything you give, again, goes to the work of God here at Grace. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. <laughs> the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will see.
is right, our duty, and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. And therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
you may stand or kneel. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now as our Father, as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Amen.
Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us see the feast. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs of your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and be in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Life. 
passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always Just 